With the publication of Leviathan, Thomas Hobbes became one of the most influential political philosophers, but interpretations of his work have changed considerably across the decades. His writings were scandalous in his own time because they seemed to lead to atheism and a denial of the truth of the Christian scripture. Leviathan was also denounced by his contemporaries as a rebel's catechism. They meant by this a text that would undermine the rights of monarchs and potentially lead to open rebellion. But today, most readers are worried about the opposite problem, that his text provides a defense of absolutist and authoritarian government. We'll look at different interpretations of Hobbes' writings, including his views on religion, morality, colonialism, and the family. For an introduction to Hobbes' text Leviathan, you can check out my other video. Here, we'll look at different interpretations of Hobbes' work. I'm James Muldoon, I'm a lecturer in political science at the University of Exeter, and this is Interpretations of Hobbes' Writings. The State of Nature and Colonialism Hobbes' depiction of the state of nature as a war of all against all became widely influential and is still used in current political discourse. But is the state of nature trying to make an empirical claim about either past or existing societies? I state that the natural condition of human beings is an inference made from the passions. I'm therefore making a claim about human nature based on the observations of my own thoughts and feelings and of my experience with others. But he also makes explicit mention of what he calls the savage people in parts of America. In the context of European colonialism, this remark, along with several others, gives an unmistakable impression of some kind of hierarchy of civilization. You might say that the reference to America is just a rhetorical device to conjure up certain images in the reader's mind. Hobbes does seem to suggest that there's never actually been any time in which the state of nature was a general condition of humankind. But whatever Hobbes intended his readers to take from this, the idea of savages living in a state of nature was a key part of European colonial ideology. To what extent did Hobbes participate in this colonial project of justifying European superiority over the rest of humankind? Hobbes is an interesting case because unlike many other writers in the 17th century, his materialist philosophy has an explicit doctrine of human equality. He doesn't say, for example, that men are naturally stronger or more intelligent than women, or that any other physical attribute makes one group of people superior to another. One interpretation of Hobbes' state of nature is that we shouldn't read this as making any kind of historical claim. It doesn't matter for Hobbes' argument what societies looked like outside of Europe, because the state of nature was an ever-present possibility if European societies descended into civil war. The image then on this reading is not meant to convey a historical lesson, but to warn against rebellion against the sovereign. The reference to America also sits alongside other explanatory points and examples. A second example he offers is the sphere of international relations. Although there may never have been a time where actual human beings were in a condition of a state of nature, sovereigns find themselves in a lawless world of rivalries and jealousies against other sovereigns. This has perhaps been one of the most lasting influences of Hobbes' theory because it's still present in many theories of international relations. Although Hobbes didn't write very much about the New World, he did have access to several travel accounts through his work with the Cavendish family. He was also involved in the Virginia Company where he represented his employer's interests. Evidence suggests that Hobbes was probably present when the family received a letter about a massacre that occurred in 1622 around Jamestown. So Hobbes couldn't have been ignorant to the context in which he was writing and how his theories would be likely received. It's also important to put arguments for internal sovereignty in the domestic sphere in relation to the construction of empire abroad. The Hobbesian rationalization of the state made colonialism and imperialism possible. By depicting non-European societies as potentially in a state of nature, he discouraged European powers from recognizing alternative political organizations and systems of governance. His motif of savage anarchy remains central to the colonial project of justifying state sovereignty, women and the family. Women occupy an ambiguous position in Hobbes' political theory because of the contrast between their roles in a state of nature and in civil society. While he says that women are equal to men in strength and intelligence in a state of nature, they become subordinated to them in a patriarchal civil society. The question therefore posed by feminist theorist Carol Pateman is why would free and equal women in a state of nature agree to a contract that would lead to them being dominated by men? She argues that beneath the social contract, 
there is an implicit sexual contract as a repressed dimension of contract theory. She underlines that the new civil society created through the contract will be a patriarchal order. Here, men's freedom and women's subjection are both created through this original contract. Unlike other theorists, Hobbes denies that there's any natural hierarchy between men and women in nature. In a state of nature, it's the mother rather than the father who has natural dominion over the child. The mother nourishes the child from birth, and so the child owes its life to her. But Hobbes assumes that in civil society, families will have a man as the head of the household. He says that for the most part, commonwealths are created by men, and that civil law gives men dominion over the family. Pateman argues that the social contract is thus made between free men. But this leaves the issue of what happens to women. They couldn't be left behind in a state of nature because this would undermine the purpose of the contract but nor are they allowed into the public sphere of civil society. At this point, it's also important to remember that for Hobbes, there can be no marriage in a state of nature because this requires a contract and long-term commitments. But he does think there will be families in a state of nature, and he has a very strange definition of what these are. A family consists of a father and his children, a father and his slaves, or a father and his children and slaves together, wherein the father or master is called the sovereign. So a family is a group of people with a man at the head and children and slaves underneath him. You'll notice that Hobbes doesn't even mention women. Through what Hobbes calls natural conquest, one man can subordinate another person to his will. Together, they then form a confederate which Hobbes calls a family. Pateman's argument is therefore that despite the fact Hobbes doesn't say there's any natural inequality between men and women, he implies that by the time the social contract is made, all women will be subordinated to men in naturally occurring families. The contract is thus between free and equal men. Pateman assumes that women have been designated in the category of slaves. Once the families are in civil society, the subordination of women to men is secured through a marriage contract. There are other feminist interpretations of Hobbes' work, but the question remains as to how and why free and equal women would choose to subordinate themselves within a patriarchal social order. Religion. There is a tendency among modern interpreters to see Hobbes as a closet atheist. This is to say someone who held no genuine religious convictions, but had to frame their argument through using religious language because of the dangers of being considered an atheist. One of the main pieces of evidence offered is Hobbes' denial of what he calls immaterial substances, or spirits. Given that most accounts of God and our soul see these as immaterial, it's hard to see Hobbes as an orthodox Christian. But Hobbes vigorously denied being an atheist and saw this as a very considerable insult. He frequently refers to God in his writings, so to say that he simply didn't believe in him might be putting things a little too strongly. But he did offer a somewhat controversial account of God's existence. He didn't think God was an entity of which we could have a clear conception or image through the use of our reason. So he denies the traditional idea of a just, benevolent, and omniscient God. He thinks that the only thing that we could reasonably say about God's existence is that the universe must have had a first cause, and that we could justifiably call this God. So this picture isn't that far from a pretty orthodox view that we simply can't have any knowledge of God through the use of human reason. But in later texts after the Leviathan, Hobbes will go a step further and actually say that God is what he calls a corporeal spirit. This means that God has extension, or a body, which is a very strange claim because it would mean that God would be somehow extended throughout the universe. If we take this to be Hobbes' mature position, then we might claim that he is some kind of very unorthodox theist. But Hobbes' scholar and biographer, A.P. Martinic, has argued that Hobbes was actually a relatively orthodox and sincere Christian. He claims that many of his core beliefs didn't differ that significantly from other Protestant Christians of his time. He doesn't think that Hobbes' denial of free will, his attacks on Aristotelian philosophy, or his criticisms of immaterial substances should lead us to see Hobbes as an anti-Christian. He claims that Hobbes was trying to meet the challenge that the new science of Copernicus and Galileo posed for Christianity. His goal was to show that a relatively orthodox reading of the scripture could actually be compatible with the new sciences. Hobbes' interpretation of Christianity sought to show how angels, miracles, heaven and hell, and all these other aspects of the Bible might actually conform to physical laws. The result is a very strange account of Christianity. He holds that God is a material being, that there's no other dimensions of heaven and hell, and that God will actually return to this earth which will become the kingdom of God. There's still a lot of disagreement about Hobbes' views on religion, and in particular what his metaphysical beliefs were. How do you think this relates to the claims that Hobbes makes in Leviathan? Morality and Ethics 
The most common older view of Hobbes' moral philosophy was that he adhered to some form of psychological egoism. Many commentators have argued that Hobbesian individuals are purely self-interested, which denies the influence of moral ideas. The only effective motivations in Hobbes' egoistic psychology are the incentives of pleasure and pain. On this view, Hobbes doesn't have an independent moral philosophy. But this reading is less common today, and a number of interpreters have developed more sophisticated readings of a Hobbesian ethics. Many of these readings relate to how one interprets Hobbes' laws of nature, both their origin and the duties or obligations they impose on subjects. Remember that Hobbes sets out both rights and laws of nature. His right of nature is the right of self-preservation grounded in a subject's will. His laws of nature amount to the idea that we should treat others the way we want to be treated. One possibility of interpreting these laws of nature is to see them as literal commands from God. On this view, God's laws of nature are discoverable by each of us through our reason and make an objective claim for our obedience. The laws of nature are substantive moral principles that we must follow on pain of divine punishment. An alternative view is that the laws of nature are merely prudential guidelines that we should follow as rational beings to seek peace. This is closer to the older view that Hobbes didn't have an independent moral philosophy. There is some evidence for this because Hobbes will explicitly say that the laws of nature are not laws properly understood. Rather, they are qualities that dispose men to peace and to obedience. Sharon Lloyd has recently argued an alternative view. She claims that the laws of nature are moral instructions for seeking the common good. She argued that the laws of nature were centered on a concern for reciprocity. By conforming to these laws, we are better able to seek the common good with others in society. For Lloyd's reciprocity interpretation, our actions will be in conformity with the laws of nature on the following grounds. We should imagine ourselves as on the receiving end of our own actions, and if we would consider these actions to be unreasonable. Lloyd seeks to uncover a psychologically more complex version of Hobbes' moral philosophy, one that would replace the crude egoism of previous interpretations. How do you think we should interpret Hobbes' laws of nature, and what kind of obligations do they place on us? 20th century interpretations. I'll finish with two famous interpretations of Hobbes that have done a lot to define how he's been read in the 20th century. The first is offered by Leo Strauss, who published The Political Philosophy of Thomas Hobbes in 1936. Strauss argues that Hobbes' political views are not in fact based on his scientific method, but were in fact developed prior to this through his moral observations of other human beings. Strauss thinks that Hobbes couldn't come to the conclusions that he does about human nature through the scientific method alone. Instead, he thinks that Hobbes' views are based primarily on the very unscientific method of just looking inside himself and also observing other people in his society. Strauss sees Hobbes as an ethical modernist who is making claims about how the good society should be organised. He suggests that Hobbes' theory of the state was constructed through an amalgamation of the traditions of democracy and monarchy. Hobbes' idea of the state was founded on an artificial monarchy that was based on a social contract of the multitude of individuals in society. Another highly influential account of the 20th century was that offered by C.B. Macpherson, who claimed that Hobbes' morality was essentially a bourgeois morality. Macpherson argued that Hobbes put forward the psychological characteristics of a typical individual in a capitalist society, and tried to pass these off as universal characteristics of our human nature. The drive for power and glory was a trait most found in individuals operating in competitive market societies. Macpherson emphasizes that crucial to Hobbes' account is a very individualistic worldview. He utilizes a methodological individualism that starts with a single person as the basic building block of society. Macpherson justifies his reading by saying that Hobbes was representative of a growing capitalist economy in 17th century England. Critics have claimed that Macpherson tends to overemphasize the extent of capitalist development in Hobbes' time. Today we focus mainly on Leviathan, and we haven't actually touched upon the relationship between Hobbes' three main works of political philosophy. The mainstream view is that there are some differences between them, but Hobbes saw himself as developing a single account. There are also many other interesting points worth exploring in Hobbes scholarship. The problem with Hobbes is that there's been so much written about him you can't cover it all. I hope this gives you a taste and encourages you to check out other interpretations of Hobbes' work. Don't forget to check out my other videos and subscribe for more political philosophy.